Let's kick off the new year, and the new decade, by closing out one of our mini-series from last year. Technically, today's subject isn't a direct part of Akiyoji Soji's Buddhist trilogy, but it certainly deserves to be included in this collection. Moving on from the closing entry in the series, Poem, Jisoji continued working in film through diverse avenues. While he would later return to Tokusatsu, his first film post-Buddha found itself in a predicament. It tried to get away from the abstraction and politicism of Jisoji's earlier three projects, yet its themes and interests fell largely in line with this transient life, mandala, and poem. With this in mind, let's jump into Akio Jisoji and Crew's first project after several years of rest. His fourth theatrical film, It Was a Faint Dream, an adaptation of a 1300s manuscript concerning Japanese court life as told by a noblewoman turned Buddhist nun. It Was a Faint Dream is somewhat based upon the diary Toazugatari, translated as something like an unasked for tale. At least that's how it's literally translated. When the book finally made its way into the English speaking world circa 1970, it was renamed The Confessions of Lady Nijo. In keeping with the noble women of medieval Japanese writing, like Lady Murasaki, Takasue's daughter, or Sei Shonagon, we don't know the birth name of Lady Nijo, instead referring to her in this case using the name of a street, Nijo, or Second Avenue. Naming aside, calling Lady Nijo's work a diary may be a bit untrue, given that large amounts of it seem to have been written from her recollections later in life, rather than in real time. Unfortunately for Lady Nijo, it would be hundreds of years before the general population would come to know her and her story. After the manuscript was copied by hand throughout the years, it was lost. No one knows exactly how this happened, because for literally hundreds of years the book wasn't even known to exist. It was that completely forgotten. As it turned out, a copy of the Confessions of Lady Nijo made its way into the Imperial Household Library at some point, but it was misfiled. That's right, this extreme example of lost media was right under the noses of those with access to this library for who knows how long, and it wasn't until Yamagishi Tokuhei, a scholar, uncovered the manuscript in 1940 in the geography section of the library. Realizing immediately what he had come across, Tokuhei set about annotating the book. The book languished in Tokuhei's possession for 10 years due to World War II, the American occupation, and the shortages and censorship that accompanied these two periods. In 1950, the book was published in its entirety, with a second edition arriving in 1966, this version including all of Tokuhei's annotations. As Karen Brazel states in her introduction to the English edition, this second version was complete and annotated and quote-unquote therefore readable. Backtracking a moment here, it might be misleading to say that this version of Lady Nijo's book was complete. As similar to other classics from the Japanese canon, there's no guarantee this is the entire original manuscript. In fact, more than once the book skips large chunks of time between four and nine years, meaning that we'll never know if this is the entirety of Lady Nijo's confessions. Getting into the content of the text itself, Lady Nijo was born into high society among the Japanese imperial court. This was in the 1270s, right in the middle of the Kamakura period and almost 100 years after the emperor had been stripped of his power by the shogun and about 200 years since the institution of the cloistered emperor system. While the court might have lacked much real power during this time besides that of the retired emperor, the lives of the court nobles remained elevated far above the commoners in terms of wealth and pomp. Lady Nijo was born into this environment. A daughter of one branch of the Minamoto clan, their branch descended from Emperor Murakami. As a child, Lady Nijo was pressed to become a concubine to retired Emperor Go Fukakusa in the period between his time as reigning emperor from 1246 to 1260 and his rule as cloistered emperor from 1287 to 1290. Nijo's and Go Fukakusa's relationship was complicated to say the least. She writes in her book about the trauma she experienced as a child becoming a concubine, though she writes that later in life she had developed affection for him, a sentiment which strikes the modern reader as a form of Stockholm Syndrome. Things were made more messy when Go Fukakusa's brother, another retired emperor, began to equally express affections for her in secret. Things only got worse, as Nijo writes, thanks to Go Fukakusa's primary partner, Higashi Nijo, absolutely despising Lady Nijo 
from the time she was a child. Lobbying heavily from her position as a retired empress for years on end, Higashi Nijo eventually succeeded in having Lady Nijo turned away from the family's estate in 1283. By this time, her father had died, leaving her in a weakened political position, who stayed strong thanks to Go Fukakusa's affections. It also didn't help that the one child she had by the retired emperor died as a baby. It also probably didn't help that, by the time she was kicked out in her mid-twenties, Nijo bore three other children, all two men other than Go Fukakusa. The events just described compose the first three books of Lady Nijo's manuscript, at least as the book is delineated by Karen Brazel. That leaves two more books which take up maybe half of the rest of the collection's page count. Everything up to this point occurred between 1271 and 1283, ages 14 to 26 for Lady Nijo. Once she was kicked out of the court, with nowhere to really go, Lady Nijo became a Buddhist nun. As a nun, Nijo traveled greatly, using her religious pilgrimages as an excuse to constantly move about the country and fulfill her wanderlust. Karen Brazel even notes that Nijo went on many more pilgrimages than average, even for nobles of the period. You might say it seems like a remarkable shift for someone who had been mostly non-religious and completely stationary for her adolescent life. And you'd be right. This is exactly what makes The Confessions of Lady Nijo so remarkable. It's a fascinating travelogue like, perhaps literally, no other from the Kamakura period, and an inside look at the court life of a Japanese era not really known for its court life. After all, this was the beginning of the Shogun era, meaning most interested in Japanese history are drawn to examine the rise of this new empire over the mostly impotent court. If you haven't already taken a look at this overlooked piece of history, be sure to check it out. With that mini book review in the bag, let's move on to the actual focus of this video, Akiyoji Soji's It Was a Faint Dream, a mostly faithful adaptation which explores Lady Nijo's court life and her Buddhist life in equal measure. As we see in the introduction to It Was a Faint Dream, the Kamakura period court, like the Heian period court seen in the tale of Princess Kaguya, is completely removed from the outside world. This is shown with court life being intercut with shots of the first Mongol invasion of Japan. Taking one more side street here, the first and second Mongol invasions of Japan, in 1274 and 1281 respectively, were the Mongol Empire's two attempted incursions into the land of the rising sun, first via their occupied area of modern-day Korea, and second via China. The first invasion failed after three successive Japanese defeats on outlying islands followed by two Mongol defeats. This effectively pushed the Mongols back to Korea, at which point they stewed for seven years before attempting a second invasion. The second time, the Japanese military were prepared, meaning they more or less completely destroyed the Mongols who came to fight. Adding insult to injury, the second invasion was capped off by a massive, out-of-season typhoon, which helped level the Mongol navy off the coast of Japan once and for all. This incident was referred to as the Divine Win, or more recognizably, Kamikaze. In later years, this mythologized typhoon incident would be used by Japanese nationalists to push the idea that Japan was a holy, sanctified land that was untouchable. So while the second attempted invasion may have been completely one-sided in favor of the Japanese military, the first was much, much worse for the Japanese. Getting back to the movie, for real this time we promise, we have the violence and the terror of the first invasion brought up first thing in It Was a Faint Dream. We see peasants being attacked by Mongols, showing that this was the reality faced by citizens of the northwestern islands of Japan, nestled between the mainland and Korea. Immediately after these scenes of assault, we switch over to painted picture scrolls of these very battles. Subtly and starkly, Jisoji and company are here setting the stage and showing us how reality differs from how the court experiences these harsh truths. The court itself is completely removed from these troubles, just as they are removed even from Kamakura, the shogun's capital of the time for which the era is named. In other words, we are seeing that Lady Nijo is born into a world removed both from the pain of everyday life and the military strategies being put into place to counter these incursions. Here, Lady Nijo, or as she is known in the film, Lady Shijo, is primarily interested in how the men and women of her social circles treat her. 
From an early point, the women she is raised with are shown to be utterly catty. We witness them talking about Shijo's appearance and gossiping about her character and upbringing, sometimes when she's in the same room. The men, meanwhile, show affection for her to a creepy degree. The men want her body, regardless of her own desires. Some, namely a Buddhist monk who pursues her, even put her before their better judgment and their own self-interests. These might sound like character elements drawn from fantasy, too fake to be real too exaggerated even. But in truth, both of these elements are drawn more or less one for one from the original text. Also, as with Lady Nijo's book, however, the film is not merely interested in showing what court life was like. It Was a Faint Dream exists primarily as a character study, candidly examining the emotional and spiritual effects upon Shijo that these men's lust and these women's envy breed. In short, pretty much everyone is terrible to her. Shijo calls her lord the worst person ever, which sounds like it could have been ripped straight from the book, while the aforementioned monk blames her for corrupting his purity. He's the one to pursue her non-stop, yet he predictably heaps all of the fault on her after he's gotten what he wants. He is driven so mad, according to him, that he copies five Buddhist precepts in her handwriting, praying fervently to be reborn with her. By comparison, once Shijo leaves her pampered court life, she encounters a pleasure woman. After speaking with her for a while, Shijo describes her as a noble person, having nothing but praise for her. During the same sequence, several other prostitutes leave home to join a traveling Pure Land Buddhist priest. Instead, this woman refuses. Putting it way more plainly than any of the men or women of the court, the pleasure woman says she enjoys sex with men, and that it makes her money. As she puts it, quote, why quit something you like that makes you money, end quote. This one interaction recontextualizes all of the previous squabbles, love-hate feuds, and uncomfortable pursuits of Shijo. Here, we see that Shijo has finally had the wool removed from her eyes. She was born with it already pulled down, and only now that she's escaped her hometown and given up all the clout and the comfortability that came with it, can she truly be happy and come into her own. On the other hand, It Was a Faint Dream examines the second half of Shijo's life, particularly from a Buddhist perspective. Here, we see even more of the differences between the commoners and the court nobles. The aforementioned traveling preacher of the Pure Land sect reminds Shijo of the monk who had affection for her earlier in life, the same one who used her and tossed her away. These two monks are used to expound upon the differences between the main Buddhist sects present in Kamakura, Japan. Two of the three main groups, Shingon and Tendai, were more or less reserved for the intelligentsia. These two had been popular since the 9th century with Japanese court nobles. Both required huge amounts of reading and study, being not just dogmatic, but largely philosophical. As you might have guessed, the amount of doctrine involved in Shingon and Tendai completely barred membership outside of the court, given that literacy and education were reserved more or less exclusively for the nobility and the religious elite. Pure Land, meanwhile, while an earlier tradition, arrived in Japan in numerous denominations throughout the Heian and Kamakura periods. Of course, there's a bit of nuance going on here between the different versions of Pure Land Buddhism. However, in their simplest form, Pure Land Buddhism required only the intonation of Namu Amida Butsu, which means something like, I take refuge in the Amida Buddha. This naturally appealed to the common folk who couldn't read sutras or who didn't have time for philosophical explorations of their faith. Instead, Pure Land Buddhism offered salvation if only one were to ask for refuge in the Amida Buddha. After we see these three faiths juxtaposed and contrasted with one another, we observe a noblewoman shown writing repeatedly Namu Amida Butsu, rather than studying or postulating on her own Buddhist beliefs. This woman may very well be similar to the pleasure woman mentioned earlier, taking time for herself and her own life rather than dedicating it to religious studies. At the same time, this is juxtaposed with an intense exorcism at the hands of the court monk who earlier fell for Shijo. We're perhaps meant to ask, which one of these two is in the right? Which is taking advantage of others, or benefiting their world more? More directly, Buddhism is shown in the second half of the film, when Shijo is thrown out of Go Murakami's court, and she becomes a nun. She travels around just as Lady Nijo did, seeming genuinely happier than in the first half of the film. 
we witnessed Shijo's abuse at the hands of the court and the unhappiness that came with it. Now, as she takes on the role of the prostitute mentioned before, doing what she wants and what makes herself happy, she becomes truly happy. Throughout her early life, Shijo made mistakes and was wronged, but learned from them in turn to become a truly good person. She's held onto her past and yet has moved past it, as shown in how she retains her artistic abilities in spite of becoming a less regal citizen. This actually happened to Lady Nijo, with commoners being blown away by her abilities at painting. Unfortunately, the Buddhist precepts of the day dictate that women stand a rung below men on their way to nirvana. This means that no matter what Shijo does, her own beliefs as a Buddhist nun dictate that she can't truly reach enlightenment. Perhaps due to this, or perhaps in spite of this, Shijo is freed from responsibility, becoming her own person. Throughout the second half of the film, Shijo visits Kamakura, which was, again, basically the real capital at that point. Along the way, she comments on how life since leaving Kyoto has felt like a dream. This plays into the title as well as the theme of the film, that being the Buddhist belief in different planes of existence, and how the movement between each plane makes prior experiences feel like a dream. The road to Kamakura and the film as a whole serve as an examination of this phenomenon the dream that is history, memories, and life itself. It was a faint dream caps off the Buddhist trilogy in a distant time, place, and government, providing one final statement on how the Buddhists of the time saw the world, and what we can learn about the human condition from this dreamlike state. This final film, in our opinions, is easily the most interesting of the trilogy, if not the best, just by virtue of how different it is. Be sure to check this one out, and check out the series as a whole. Let us know in the comments what you think of Akiyoji Soji's Buddhist trilogy, and, in particular, it was a faint dream.